Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Hey, Andrew, here we are. We are, and I think a, a, a good double issue this, this week. Uh, it's going to be a long one. <laughs> a long one, but well worth listening to. Buckle up. It's, it's very much close to the sort of what we're trying to do, which is to look at events and to see how things were often covered up uh, and, and how that happened, and to have doughty fighters who are prepared to, to fight for the truth. And we've got two of those this week, Andy Webb and Norman Baker. That's Should right. I say a little bit about uh, Norman, and then you talk about Andy? Yeah, good idea. Norman is a is a is quite a coup to get him. Actually, he's been a, a one of the sort of great troublemakers in national life for a long time. Just the sort of person we like. Yeah, I have a terrific admiration for him, and, and in some ways, I'm a I'm a mini mini Norman Baker. I hope. But he was, I mean, he was an MP from 1997 to 2015, a Minister of State in the Home Office, who then resigned. Uh, he's um, won various sort of awards as a parliamentarian, Inquisitor of the Year for the Spectator. Uh, but he's he's had a whole series of campaigns in Parliament and now since he's left outside Parliament, uh, of which I suppose one of the best known was on MPs' expenses, which he really pressed on. Uh, but I think this time we're going to talk about Flight 149, which is a, um, a Trojan horse, in effect, aircraft that was sent into Kuwait. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about his Republican views and the monarchy. And I think also we're going to to touch on the David Kelly case, which a lot of people have asked us about and which he's written a book about. Yes, the the, the Kuwait story, that goes back to the, the first Gulf War, doesn't it? It's a British Airways flight that is, it lands in Kuwait when the Iraqi army, if it's not there, it's very close. Lots of other planes have already been cancelled or diverted. And there's always been a suggestion that there was a kind of cloak and dagger element to that story and it led to a lot of people suffering about two or three hundred people taken hostage paraded on television terrified yeah um, what well i know really going on a certain amount about it because stephen davis who wrote a book about it was represented by me and we saw that book many years ago and and then mysteriously the publisher mm-hmm. cancelled the contract uh, and uh, he eventually was able to find a new publisher subsequently. But, you know, one wonders what sort of pressure has been put on behind the scenes. I mean, Norman Baker talks about how data was removed from his hard drive uh, when he was investigating David Kelly. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think there's some very dark things going yeah. on sometimes. But we should say, what, he said he was an MP. What party was uh, Liberal he was a Liberal Democrat? Liberal Democrats, um, so and on the left wing, the Liberal Democrats. But um, you know, he was part of the coalition government, uh, a member of the Privy Council. Um, I, I, I've seen interviews how he talked of, of actually having to go and kiss the Queen's hand. How the Royals actually try and avoid him um, because he's seen to be a troublemaker. But we yes. love troublemakers. They're what we do. Well, he he digs and he finds things out, and that uh, I guess is a connection to the first guest we're going to hear from, which is um, somebody who's been on the show before, Andy Webb who is the man who exposed the BBC Martin Bashir Princess Diana scandal. Um, worked. He's already done a whole programme on it. But this week, there's been lots of new developments on that, uh, including a whole load of emails released. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about that. Um, so we should we should rattle on because we've got a lot to cram in. Yes. I, well, maybe next time we'll cover all the reviews that we're getting and um, the responses. Uh, and, and it's week. lovely to see that those are growing. They are actually. I have to say, thank you to everybody who's listening and watching. It's, it's, it's really ratcheting up. We're getting about six, seven thousand downloads a week now across all the platforms, which is we couldn't really have dreamt of that a year ago, and we're so grateful. So hopefully, this program will meet a similarly appreciative audience. Here we go, Andy. Welcome back. No, lovely to be back. Lovely to be back. Yeah, yeah well, I don't know where Andrew's gone. He's gone walk about somewhere, uh, having his regular struggle with technology and the modern world in general. But um, I'm here, and I'm very keen to talk to you because there's been loads of new, you know, you've been, the word dogged was invented for you, I think, in terms of being a reporter. You, you've been working away for so long, and you've finally shaken out some new information. You want to tell us all about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just will stress, though, Phil, I, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating, a fascinating story, and you say I, I am dogged i just want would want to you know dispel any notions i'm sort of a 
you know, loony in the attic, you know, able only to focus or... You are right now in an attic, I can see. I am in an attic, maybe a bit of a, a loony, but but you, you know what I'm saying. I, I, do. I, do, have a, I do have a day job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I pursue this because I, I say to myself, and I've been a journalist for donkey's years um who wouldn't i mean this is it seems to me absolutely fascinating story and i genuinely genuinely think it has you know historical significance you know, i.e when 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 i'm long long gone you know historians journalists will be pouring over exactly what happened to the person who should have could have been queen diana you know, I often often think of it in the way, you know, you look at, say, Wolf Hall, mm. and we're all kind of gripped as to exactly what Anne Boleyn was up to with, you know, the, the dog handler, the loot player, whoever, you know, uh, you know, in 500 years time, people will be wondering, you know, how it was that, well, you know, Princess Diana was betrayed, who said what to who, you know. And and you know I do I do think it has that sort of significance. And I also again, you know, journalists, you know, people talk about journalists writing the first draft of history. And and again, in this in the case of this story, I sort of think yeah, I sort of you know. Oh, well, Andrew Andrew is now here. Hello, Andrew. Welcome to. Hello. So sorry to I, I deleted the link. Oh, but, welcome so to the party. I'm here. But actually, I was just interesting to hear you say that, Andy, because I, I guess in a sense, the first draft was the Bashir interview. What you've done is you've actually turned it into history by applying some rigor and some analysis, um, I which was yeah, sadly I mean, lacking for a long time. Like. Yeah, no, I, I sort of I suppose saying that you know the, the first draft of history, and as much as a, an, a sort of an analysis, an attempt at an analysis, an attempt at an attempt at an assessment. You know, I, I sometimes feel like we're talking about you know doggedly working away alone on this, and Andrew. With his historical knowledge, and and you two will recognise this, but I, I sometimes feel like one of these, one of these, you know, medieval pre-medieval scribes who only have one name, you know, like Gerald of Wales or, you know, <laughs> Matthew of Cirencester, and I sort of sometimes feel like, oh. you know, Andy of Chiswick, you know, you know, in six hundred years time, oh yeah, this this, oh yeah, the, the madman in the attic who spent fifty exactly. years. Writing the most beautifully illustrated manuscript about the right. you know, but that's why I keep at it because you know, um, you know, as I say, you know, uh, scandal mongers, but scandals do come and go, and they can come and go quite quickly. I mean, yes, what did Hugh Edwards get up to? What did Russell Brand get up to? What did Rolf Harris get up to? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. All of those things, of course, they're worth. Um, of course, they're worth exploring. I, I wouldn't, frankly, want to devote two, three, four, five years of my life to, you know, work out what what Hugh Edwards shared on, you know, the internet with, with his young friend. You yeah, know? I, I totally get that. But I, I mean, maybe it's something that's excited me more than you, these new emails, because one of the things that's come out is that Martin Bashir in 2000, I think, in attempting to defend himself, played the card of um, jealous colleagues, which we have discussed before. That's what was said. When he was mm. criticised by people on the Panorama team, mm. they were jealous colleagues. But he also brought in the element of race, which upset me a little bit because I know those men well. You know them. I know them well, especially Harry, Harry Dean. And I'm here to say that Martin partly owed his career to Harry. Harry was a great supporter of Martin. One of the reasons he'd gone on to Panorama, where we were all working together at the time. Um, the idea that he was in any way prejudiced against Martin for any reason is ridiculous. Um, but maybe that just shows how desperate they were feeling within the BBC uh, in 2000, when you were really ranking up the pressure. I mean, you've, you've now got this insight into what happened yeah, inside I, I, when you were knocking on the door outside. Yeah, I mean, what, what you were just referring to there, Phil, I think it is quite interesting. It's actually interesting to me for a couple of reasons. I mean, basically, I think what you're referring to there is was actually an exchange of emails that took place in 2020, much, much, much more recently, obviously, than 2000. Um, what happened was... In 2020, as the 25th anniversary of the Panorama interview is rapidly approaching, then the BBC, um, you know, had guessed that there would be some attention paid to it, some coverage of it. So um, it appears what, what happened was Martin Bashir was contacted by a chap called Robert Seater within the uh, within the BBC, a chap titled Head of History. Um, and there was a discussion and it was in, in the course of that discussion in 2020 
uh, that Martin Bashir, you know, made made his thoughts known, saying that way way back in 1996, when 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 elements of the scandal began to emerge, he he made those claims you're talking about. But it's interesting, very very interesting to me for a completely different reason, a completely different reason, which is this: that the these emails which I received this week, 10,000 pages of data, 3,288 emails, wow. 10,000 pages of data. Uh, I'd requested them over a very specific time period, September, October, November 2020. That being, and it can get very, very complicated, but that being the period in which I believe that various um, potentially incriminating emails were exchanged. So that all this massive a massive body of data finally arrives this week and it's redacted from top to bottom and side to side and you name it and it has to all be analyzed and challenged and that's going to take a long long time but getting to the point of this martin bashir exchange where he's making these claims of um racism and so on and so forth i looked at that that's actually a, an email that was sent in july of 2020 Hang on, because I, I wasn't looking for July, September, October, this was July. Not only that, amidst all the emails and this massive, massive, massive batch, it's n- not redacted at all. There's all this kind of really personal stuff, fascinating stuff, etc. Cetera, et cetera, there's no, no redaction applied there. And I'm thinking, gosh, that is really, really weird because... Of all the emails that I received, that is the one, and I absolutely understand why, but that is the one that when they saw it, the various newspapers from the Times to the Mail and you know everybody in between went straight for that. That was the story. That was the story on the front page of the Mail. And I'm saying, I'm scratching my head thinking, gosh, how did that, how did that email from the wrong time period and unredacted get in there? Because... You know, obviously, we're you know, journalists saying, hey, where's this? Hey, see, this? this is the story. And as I say, you know, you can get much, much too cynical, too suspicious, too conspiracy minded in, 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 in this world. But let's, let's just put it this way. If one was into a little bit of news management and thinking, what kind of red meat can we throw these wretched uh, journalists? What, what, what bit of red meat are they going to? snap up so that they're looking at that not that hmm, i i don't think it's impossible because uh, i say i i'm absolutely staggered as to why this email that shouldn't be there is there and not only is it there but it's not redacted and it's absolutely the one that immediately attracted all this attention so i mean it's a question that i will be certainly raising not you know, just 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 a, a, a query that I will raise when we all go back to the tribunal and, and, and it's discussed and redactions and what was there and what wasn't there. Anyway, very, I, I, I was interviewed you know, quite a lot about this um, this week when these emails came out and people, and of course people said to me, hey, what about this Martin Bashir racism stuff? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, f- fascinating that Martin Bashir thought that. What I've got to say to you is that ironically, um, the, the BBC position, their official position, their official stance on all of this, which I find absolutely extraordinary, is that all of these emails are irrelevant, even even though they sort of popped up in a, in, a, in an electronic search, whereby the search terms were dictated by the BBC, not me. It wasn't, you know, I hadn't asked for some wacky. They chose the keyword search terms. They chose the from and the to, the only thing I chose is, as I say, the time period, this key mm. three period. So they set the search terms, search, 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 10,000 pages of data, and then they say, oh, but, sorry, but it's all irrelevant. Okay, fine. Well, what, why why do they say quite, it's irrelevant? I'm sorry? So you have quite a robust judge, Judge Kennedy. So what is yeah. he going to do, given that not everything has been released? Um, well, it, it, it's. I suppose you could say it's all been released. It's just <laughs> there's been, you know, uh, just thousands, thousands, and thousands and thousands and thousands of redactions. So yes, what will Judge Kennedy and and, and, his, and his two colleagues do? What what happens next um, is sorry, Andrew. That's a really good question. I will get to it, but do, uh, just let me just literally. I'm going. I'm going to. But just put the. I'll just put the final sentence on, on where's going. The other thing, 
is that this um, Martin Bashir stuff about racism, that is irrelevant. Uh, you know, and I, I sort of made that point when I was interviewed. I said, yeah, you know, the BBC says it's all irrelevant, and I don't believe that for one second. But the one thing that is clearly irrelevant was that. It has absolutely nothing to do with, with, the, with, with the topic of, that I was, you know, asking about. Anyway, so what, uh, what will happen? Yes, well, uh, the BBC... It, it, it's it, again. I mean, this is kind of just one of the many odd things I think in this case. The BBC said once they were ordered to turn over these emails, which they had resisted for a year, they were ordered to hand them over. And their position at that point was, "Oh my God, this is going to be a huge, huge amount of work." Which indeed it is. You know, when I do that, so I'm just pointing to another screen here, which is a computer which has all these emails on it. Um, there's a huge amount of work, huge amount of work to get it ready for the handover deadline. So much so that we actually won't have time to explain all the redactions that we've made. So all I've got at the moment is 10,000 pages of stuff with some totally blank pages, some, you know, da, da. so it's an absolute dog's breakfast, an absolute mess to look at. The BBC will not, you know, they've been given, uh, they've been allowed not to sub not to present submissions explaining what they've done for another two weeks. OK, they will then arrive. I'll look at them and OK, fine. I then have two weeks to challenge them, I, you know, to sort of say, well, no, I don't. Uh, yeah. um, now, clearly, there are literally thousands and thousands and potentially something like 20,000 redactions here. So one cannot make individual challenges to you know 20,000 times so in a sense it's going to have to be a, a generic um a, a you know a, a plea to the tribunal that look um you know there is a reason to not allow these uh, exemptions these redactions to continue and the tribunal has said that it, it is prepared to look behind these redactions and form their own view so surely, sorry to interrupt, but surely each redaction has to have an exemption beside it. Uh, I mean, one of the problems is if you've got a blank page, you don't know what you're, you're, you're dealing with. Yeah. But surely also the tribunal can ask to see the unredacted version and to see if it does comply with the, the FOI exemption. They can, Andrew, but it, it's just a simple matter of scale. 20,000, are they going to do that 20,000 times? I mean, the, the 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 body, I mean, I know you've dealt with massive, massive files in your time, but what we're talking about here is it, it's kind of, it, it's war and peace times eight. You know, it, that, it, it's of that order. Why so, are there so many, Andy? I mean, we're talking about three or four months in 2020. Hmm. Obviously, th this is all in reaction to your work and the pressure you were putting on hmm. them, but it must have been, People must be spending all day writing oh, sure. to each other about oh, sure. this stuff. Sure. When when one, and I mean, the the three thousand two hundred and eighty eight expands to that's the number of emails that expands to ten thousand pages because the emails. It's not that there's three pages of closely typed text. There are there are additions and there are images and there are da 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 da, da you know things like that. So it, it quickly expands. But yes, it was an absolutely frantic period. I mean, there was one um, particular lawyer, in fact, the principal lawyer within the BBC dealing with this, uh, and just one of the very, very bizarre, bizarre elements of this case is that uh, at an early stage in this process, he was asked to search his um, mailbox, you know, to see what emails he had. And he came up <clears throat> with the answer, 80, 80, which is, you know, it's a sort of a discrete number. You think, okay, they can be, you know, they can be, you know, it's enough that you it's the sort of number that you can look at them. Then sort of several months go by and very a lot of complicated things happen. But anyway, um, another search was done, and that same lawyer, it turns out, didn't have 80 emails in his mailbox. He had 2741. Okay. What? 80, 2000. He said he'd sort of forgotten about these other ones. But the point of the point of this is is that the time period is relatively short, only three months, 2,741 emails. You do a quick back of envelope calculation. And for just that, that lawyer, emails on just this subject were pinging in and out of his mailbox on an average 50 per day. So you know how um, 
things work. There will be busy days and slow days. Some days, and they will have been in the hundreds. And all hundreds. because they were, uh, well, what were they? They were deciding how to respond to the questions that you were asking about their knowledge of Bashir back in the 90s, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the nub of my question was um, what I wanted to really establish was why in 2020, forget you know, 1995, 96, and all this stuff. This is 2020. How was it in 2020 that the BBC um, decided to, on the one hand, make this serious allegation about Earl Spencer having co-conspired with Bashir, and at the same time, so they release that allegation, as it was actually to me, but they do not release in particular, an eight-page memo that describes the cover-up. So it's really, really simple. It's really simple what has happened. And then, as I say, what I always sort of try and stress to people is that these emails would be absolutely fascinating, but the actual, the act, as it were, and again, the, the sort of the analogy I always use is this, that the, you know, the, the, the jeweler's window has been smashed. The glass is all over the street. The necklace is missing. That's what's happened. We know that that's happened. What these emails will tell us is who was wearing the stocking masks. That, that, that's what they will tell us. They won't bring the necklace back. You know, that's already happened. Um, and, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to drop, but at what stage do you think the BBC could have put their hands up and said, yes, there's been a cover-up or a cock-up here? Uh, or, or or a scandal, and and we're going to take full responsibility and 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 and, and deal with it. I mean, there must be several opportunities to do that. Uh, you know, the cover up is often worse than the initial crime. I mean, when could they have done that, and can they still do that? Yeah, no, it's a really really good question, Andrew. And what what I think is this, and I you know I've studied this pretty closely and talked to a lot of people who are very close to this, and my my understanding of it is pretty much this. Um, 95, the Diana interview, 96, the sort of internal cover-up. And we can call it that. Lord Dyson called it that. You know, whether it's a, a woefully inadequate inquiry, well, it was a, it was a, it was an inquiry that was sufficiently perfectly adequate to keep it under wraps for 25 years, you know. Okay. So come uh 2020, as the anniversary approached, and the BBC was well aware that there were three TV companies at that point, all sort of getting documentaries ready. Mine was just one of them. And there was an internal debate in within the BBC, because if you think about it, some people by then really quite senior people in their 40s, whatever, they were in primary school when <laughs> the Panorama, they're in primary school when the Panorama interview. Make me feel old. You know, and there was a debate that said, look, um, th this is, this is, the problem of the generation past. This isn't our problem. This this isn't one for us. Um, and they, because the BBC had documentation, I'm not sure how many people actually were allowed to see it, but it you know, certainly a fair number. They had the documentation that proved what had happened back in 1996. So that there was this debate that said, "Look, you know, yeah, it's going to come out at some point. So let let it come out now." But you, you also you say to yourself, in, in, in 2020, at the time these discussions were taking place, the uh, Lord Tony Hall, who had absolutely been at the centre of events back in 1996, had literally only just left the Director General's office. He was Director General right up until August of 2020. The seat was literally still warm when... You know, Tim Davy has just taken over, and he's just finding out where the executive toilet roll is, and he's and he's and he's doing all this. At that very point, when these discussions were being had, somebody will have said, "Well, hang on, hang on, don't forget." You know, Tony, man, it ain't going to look good. And th this is my understanding of it. They sort of foolishly went down another road, which was effectively to say, "Look, you know, it's, it's kept been kept kept quiet twenty five years." Why don't we keep it quiet for another 25? And well, Sorry to interrupt. What was the role of the governors? I mean, they're meant to be independent uh, scrutineers of all this. I mean, are they at fault? Well, that's, a, again, Andrew, I mean, very good, pertinent 
Uh, yeah, good, absolutely good question. I um, let's put it this way: there, there are ten uh, non-executive. Actually, yeah, they're not called governors these days. I'm sure you know this. Governors is history. They're board members. They're members now. Anyway, there are ten members who are not because the 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 the, the sort of uber management of the BBC now has been melded. You used to have a separate board of governors and a separate board of management. They were the Board of Management of the paid execs and the Board of Governors are the the good and the great, you know, the bishops and the whatever, you know, da da da. Now, now they're sort of melded together. So on this um, board, you have ten people who are not employed by the BBC, and I think it's four who who are. Anyway, uh, just before Christmas, when the judge issued this very really genius, stinging twenty pages of, you know, I think you, you, you've seen it yourself. I know Judge Kennedy. I mean, he's good. He's an outsider. Absolutely. Um, anyway, so this is issued this stinging document. Wow. Well, I sent a copy of this document to every one of those ten board members. I'd like that. Say, look, you know, here we are. Da 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 da. I just want to be sure that you have seen this. I want to be sure that you you guys have seen this. Yeah, and we have seen this. And um, uh, response, absolutely zero. That is now, shocking. That is shocking. That's their job. That well, their job. I, I tell you, I think it is. I know I didn't send it to them out of any sense of mischief. Well, maybe the tiniest sense of mischief, but genuine sense of... Um, Responsibility, because like if if a judge is saying the, the sort of things that that judge said about the organisation, which it is your job there to oversee, to look over the people, right? You you should know about it, and, and maybe you should do something about it. But it is a very relevant question of yours, Andrew, for this reason: that back in 1996, as the cover up was being, you know, the first iteration of it was being um, put into place, of course. There was a, a meeting of what were then the governors. And it was this crucial meeting where Tony Hall rocks up with his um, you know, prepared report to the governors. What did he do? He told the governors that despite the fact that he, Hall, knew that Bashir had lied repeatedly about uh, what he'd done with these forgeries, he uh, Hall knew that Bashir had presented them as genuine documents to Earl Spencer, Diana's brother. Um, and Hall stood in front of, I presume, sat down, sat down with the governors and actually told them that, well, I've sort of looked at it and I'm convinced that um, Martin Bashir is an honest and an honourable man, he said. He said that what he, he couldn't bring himself clearly to use the word forgery. He said, the graphic graphic the graphic played no part whatsoever in gaining the interview at a point in time at which tony hall was absolutely aware that martin bashir had presented the graphic the forgery as genuine documentation now so the governor that is that was his story and the governors absolutely swallowed it wholesale if anybody there had said well Mr. Hall, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Just run by me again. How is it that a BBC reporter, as part of his tools of the trade, are faked bank statements? Let's just, can we just develop, can we talk about that a little bit more? Apparently that conversation wasn't had. Well, wasn't, wasn't this also the same meeting, <clears throat> or around the same time, where they spoke about punishing the people who'd been anxious about this, who raised it, who would yes. maybe talk to the Daily Mail or something. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. That included all my friends who, who, who are now being called racists. All these it's not absolutely. It was, it was part of Tony Hall's same presentation where he sort of rounded it off by saying they'd obviously skated over the fake bank statements because, well, yeah, 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 reporters, they're always using fake bank. No. Anyway, so they get round that and then he rounds off his report effectively to say, anyway, good news. We're, we're we're sacking the um, the graphic artist who made these uh, things, like, but not the reporter who shows them to the Princess of Wales's brother. Not uh, again. Okay, we're sacking the uh, graphic artist. We're getting. I mean, it sounds absolutely sort of Stalinist. Uh, we're getting rid of 
the leakers. I mean, he didn't use the word Our contents, didn't he? Say? Records. Yeah, but it's a sort of you know, it, you know, it's the wreckers and the counter revolutionaries, or you know, we're getting rid of the leakers and the malcontents and and da 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 da. And the governors presumably sat there. It was a morning meeting. It began at nine thirty. They sat there and thank you very much. You know, now had had one of those governors just said no 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 come on come on come on let's get let's get to the bottom of this history could have been hugely different because that cover up at that time could have absolutely begun to crumble uh critically critically had it crumbled then i think it's inevitable that princess diana would have actually been briefed that look the bad news is you've actually entertained a con man you know You've been told an enormous number of things that are just not true by this guy who has forgeries created and shows them to people. And that, I think, is the real, you know, the real sort of tragedy in all this. You know, and if the, the, the governor's, um, interestingly, I think, or to me, I actually have been talking very recently with, obviously, this meeting in 1996, when people become governors of the BBC, then generally they're eminent and and and, and some of them are, you know, el more elderly or whatever, even more elderly than you, me and Andrew, but possibly, which means that they're not around anymore. But one of the most particularly is Sir Richard Eyre, who is um, this incredibly eminent theatre, film, opera director, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, he was at that meeting in 1996 and is deeply bitter and regretful that the wall was pulled over their eyes i mean he's 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 he has described he has said that the bbc treated the governors as i think his words were wallies ineffectual fools that is so interesting because as you say there was still time to tell diana this stuff oh sure and it would have changed so much in terms of how she was behaving and the things she believed. She believed some of her closest and most loyal advisors sure, sure. were spying I mean, on her. Yeah, and that's the point, because people sort of rather scoff at, oh, well, you know, the Panorama interview, that didn't cause the crash in the um, in the tunnel in Paris. No, of course it didn't. But the point is, I think it's uh, undeniable that Diana's life would have followed a much different path had she at that point in her life, had she in... in you know, after the Panorama interview, had she been, as it were, debriefed from all these most extraordinary um, things that she'd been told, which she clearly did believe, because, you know, when one looks at this uh, extraordinary uh, meeting that she had with her solicitor, Lord Mishcon, a week before the Panorama interview, in many ways, for me, it's not the Bashir interview, that's the more interesting interview from this bit, it's that interview where Diana actually lays out in a private context, Patrick Jefferson was in the room and two seconds, but she lays out what she, the picture as she really believes it to be. The panorama mm -hmm. interview was somewhat, uh, somewhat performative exercise where Diana, um, and it's hard not to, you know, it's a little bit sort of heartbreaking, but you can see that Diana had sort of worked out a game plan whereby she would say this publicly, whereby, in fact, this is what she believes privately. And, and it was to deal with what she believed. It was to handle what she believed to be privately the case that she then goes on TV and says the things that she said. I mean, Jefferson would have still been there. She would have perhaps taken a more serious, continued to take a more serious role. She would have had police protection. She would probably have not fallen into the hands of Dodi. But, I mean, again, a question. I mean, what would you like to happen? What's happened to some of these people, apart from Richard Eyre and Tony Hall? Uh, and, um, I mean, what penalties do you think can be used? Because there was clearly criminal activity going on here. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 when the Dyson report appeared, the, the Met did look uh, to see whether what had happened, uh, you know, the way that Bashir had acted in particular sort of constituted criminality. I must say, just as an absolute lay sort of barrack room lawyer, it seems to be very, very hard because, you know, one did a bit of study of actually what constitutes forgery, what you have to do. 
and it seemed to me, and we did interview a a um, a fraud specialist um, barrister in the course of making the documentary we made, and he said, "Well, looks absolutely, you know, bang bang him up right away because you know if you." If you have forged forged documents created, which we know he did, very elaborate and, and intricate forged bank statements, and you deploy them uh, for gain, and it could very easily be argued that there was major gain, and apart from anything else, in a monetary sense, the um, Diana interview for the BBC was sold around the world, I think it was something like £1.7 million. So, um, so basically, Bashir clearly gained in some way from the deployment of these forgeries and so it seemed to be well yeah what well, what's and, and forgery isn't time barred either you know so it wasn't the time too long ago but the Met decided not to proceed I think quite interestingly <laughs> they and and I'm as you both will be well aware and it's important to stress that there is a major major difference between a police officer considering something a police force investigating something and in, and indeed deciding to prosecute so i will make that absolutely clear but it's also the case that the met did give consideration to whether there had actually been the offense committed misconduct in a public office and that's the offense that um you know applies mainly to government employees who have somehow abused the trust, the position of trust that they were given, generally speaking, expenditure of money is involved, et cetera, et cetera. And they were looking at the whether these these senior people within the BBC could be regarded as um, people in public office and, and indeed, of course, what they had done. But as I say, that is that was given consideration. The fact that it wasn't pursued is is, is clearly evidence that the police didn't think it was fruitful to do so. Well, but look, we, we said we talked to you for 20 minutes. It's now 35 and counting. It's such an interesting subject. I'm sorry to, to, to keep you for so long, but I'd love to know, you know, where you think it's going next. Where are you going next with it? You it looks like you've got a, another book in front of you if you can get the redactions removed. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, purely in terms of what happens next is, um, I think we we'll are saying the BBC will present their arguments for the redactions they've made. I will then challenge those um, those arg the, 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 you know, the arguments. The tribunal will then decide. The, what I'm truly hoping is that I can mount a sufficiently persuasive public interest uh, argument that I should be allowed to see the emails particularly that have been um, exchanged that are currently protected under legal LPP, legal uh, professional privilege, because and Andrew, with his knowledge of FOIs, which is will far exceed mine, will be aware that Ooh. some uh, exemption categories are sort of absolute. The person who holds the information says, right, it's protected under section 40, let's say, and tough luck, you know, like it or lump it. Section 42, which is the legal exemption category, is not that simple. It, it's a qualified exemption. The person claiming it, the BBC in this case, have to argue for it, and I am allowed to argue against it. And I genuinely think there is a strong public interest case to be made to see what's inside them. You know, because if if they are innocent, it, if it turns out they are innocent, I think the peculiar circumstances of this case would actually excuse it. it as a, I, I'm, I'm really trying to be ultra fair here to the BBC and say, look, I mean, clearly, I do think there is material in there which is not at all innocent. But if it turned out that all of it was. Uh, and the tribunal went so far as to allow this public interest uh, case. I think that in the future, anybody looking at it would say, yeah, well, we can see why. We can see why they decided to take the unusual step of overturning this because of the curious circumstances of the case. And indeed, if what I think is right, if, if what I think happened can be proven to have happened, I think the public interest in exposing that would be every bit as great as the public interest in exposing the Bashir scandal as a whole, because, you know, don't forget, without that having been exposed, the poor old graphic artist Matt Wiesler 
his career wrecked. He, he's off in the West Country, not doing graphic. You know, he, he was apologized to a substantial payout to reflect what had happened to his career. Patrick Jefferson, all of a sudden, it was explained to him what had happened all those years ago. And, and a large payment was made, which immediately he gave to charity. Uh, a sub very substantial payment made to the nanny, Alexandra Pettifer, known as Tiggy Leg Burke. Apologies. Money was paid to several other people. So that I think taxpayers' money. Uh, well, license fee payers' money. Yeah, license fee money. Yeah, license fee money. And what's how damaging has this been to the BBC? I, 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 I suspect really quite damaging, Andrew. I mean, people who are ill disposed to the BBC, you know, BBC bashers, you know. I mean, what's happening here is the BBC is bashing itself on the head. It's saying, it's turning around and saying, hey, anybody want to take a kick? You know, because if you, um, I'm saying to somebody who interviewed me this week, I mean, if the BBC is going as it currently is, in effect, to the culture secretary saying, you know, we're skint, can we have some more money, please? Well, if you've just spent around a quarter of a million pounds trying to, defy a freedom of information request that is not a good look you know it just isn't i mean yes a quarter of a million pounds in the greater scheme of things the bbc income is is it the total i like, guess 5.7 billion so a quarter of a million isn't even going to make you an episode of traitors but you know it's what is it three times as much money as good old harry one on traitors you know it's a substantial pot of money and it just it, it just seems to me um again what what is it do you say what's it doing out of perception what's it doing inner perception i mean the bbc is saying oh no no we're running out of money here we've got to cut back news night you know sort of being gently led towards the knacker's yard you know and there are cuts here and there are cuts there but for heaven's sake, I mean, their expenditure alone on external lawyers in this case is £151,000 to uh, hire um, this very talented, skillful, fancy lawyer, a guy called Jason Pobjoy, the, the very same chap that Boris Johnson hired to bat for him over Partygate. So, you know, that's that's sort of who I'm up against in my attic here. You know, no expense spared. My God, I wish I had a quarter of a million pounds to hire some uh, lawyers. You know, I might get, I might get really stuck in. Well, I think what you've David done is amazing. You, what you've done is incredible, and I'm so pleased you're still fighting the good fight. And uh, partly for my old mates who who also had their careers, well, I wouldn't say ruined, but compromised. Mm. And it's a David and Goliath battle. It's it's very much it's important that, that that these people are held to account, and we don't allow these cover ups. Nice. Brilliant what you're doing. And thank you once again for sharing it with us. And uh, please let us know the, what happens next. I'm sure we'll see it on the, the front page of the newspapers anyway. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you back. Give us the latest. Really? No, did I you get that. your mug is the main question. I don't think I did. No, what? I did not. So, uh, no, I didn't. I don't know whether it's um, delivered. Oh, right. Well, there's, there's, in that case, I'm very glad we've made contact. I shall send you another one. Oh, no, no, I have not had a mug, and I, I want one. <laughs> well, that's that. That's Someone's it's not, it's not quarter route. of a million pounds, but it's something. Yeah. No, <laughs> see no. you later. I will see you later. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. We're delighted to have uh, the former MP Norman Baker with us today. He's been a a very um, stringent campaigner for a more openness in in British public life, and one of his campaigns. Uh, has been on the story of Flight 149. Can you perhaps tell us a bit more about it, Norman? What happened? Yes, BA Flight 149 um, flew into Kuwait um, in uh, the time when Iraq was invading Kuwait. It was um, allowed to land because the British government did not tell British Airways that it was unsafe to do so, uh, although they clearly had information from uh, our own sources in Kuwait that it was unwise to do so, and indeed an, an invasion had already started. Uh, when the plane touched down, uh, there was um, it was a deserted airport. There were no staff there. Um, one or two people hanging around, extremely surprised that uh, this plane had landed. All other countries had abandoned flights into Kuwait hours earlier, if not days earlier. 
Um, so the idea that the British government was unaware of the situation uh, in Kuwait and of the Iraqi invasion was incredible. Uh, there's evidence subsequently emerged that uh, our own people in Kuwait warned the Foreign Office what was going on. And indeed, the Americans were aware of an intention to invade a week beforehand and passed that information on to London. So the only conclusion you can reach is that the flight in question was deliberately allowed to land for uh, reasons which have been subsequently denied by the British government. Do you have uh, a personal and... connection to it, Norman? You, did you know anybody on the flight or...? Well, I, I, I was contacted by people who uh, were on the flight who wanted me, who wanted my help to try to secure justice and frankness from the British government about what had happened. Um, so, no, no personal connections other than responding to the members of the public who contacted me. But as um, you said at the beginning, or was said at the beginning, uh, I believe in accountability in public life. I believe in freedom of information. Um, of course, that has to be tempered by the need to secure national security. Um, no one's suggesting everything should be open. But, you know, frankly, we're now talking about events which happened over 30 years ago. And there's no there's no reason why the whole truth shouldn't come out, other than the fact that it will embarrass some people who clearly have not told the truth. What do because you think the, story the whole truth has changed is? over the time? Sorry, uh, Phil. The story has changed a bit because the government did admit that they didn't pass on a warning to British Airways. But you've got affidavits from special forces saying that actually there was this was a Trojan horse operation. Uh, and yes. there was there were basically members of I think the increment or the debt going into on an intelligence gathering mission. These are ex special forces people who have left the services and are basically non deniable. Yes, on the on the on the first point about the um, failure to notify British Airways, um, that of course came out actually when Liz Trust was Foreign Secretary, as a as a result of information being put in the Public Records Office, and it shows by the way that I was told an untruth by Jeff Hoon, um, who was a minister who responded to my uh, debate in Parliament in 2007 on BA Flight 149, and indeed uh, others who similarly not told the truth in response to inquiries by the then Deputy by the then Shadow Transport Secretary John Prescott uh, back in immediately after the events in 1990 itself. In terms of uh, in terms of why the flight touched down, as you say, I've received affidavits from um, <clears throat> members of the uh, special forces who um, attended that flight and who disembarked very quickly as soon as the flight touched down uh, in Kuwait. And the affidavits they gave to me um, suggested uh, that this was an uh, officially uh, 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 approved um, activity, sanctioned by the Prime Minister, Mr. Thatcher, um, not by the Foreign Office, but by Mr. Thatcher direct, that they were um, people who were no longer in, special, in, in the special forces, uh, whether they'd retired and gone off to uh, work for uh, external organisations associated with this sort of activity, or whether they've been temporarily retired and then re-employed is not clear. But anyway, the fact that they were not officially armed forces personnel meant that the ministers could stand up and say no British forces were on the flight. However, it's very clear from the evidence from the passengers, uh, from the crew, um, from our people in Kuwait, and indeed from the Americans, that uh, they were on that flight. And the, 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 the flight was, in my view, very clearly landed, and this is what's in the affidavit, very clearly landed in Kuwait, especially to allow those people to disembark from the plane. So there's very much a weeded file, which you presumably know about at the National Archives, about the questions that you raised in Parliament and, 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 and sort of the way they needed to sort of uh, respond to you, which suggests that there was a cover-up. Well, I think there's no doubt there's a cover-up. And, and if, if affidavits from uh, people who are on the plane isn't sufficient, then what is? I mean, I, I said this all out in the debate in 2007. Um, and the response from Jeff Hoon, the minister replying at the time, was not to take the matter seriously, in my view. It was to repeat inaccurate assertions that had been made by Mrs. Thatcher in, to 1990 or by her foreign minister. Uh, and indeed, the only interest that Jeff Hoon appeared to have was learning the names of the soldiers in question from me. Um, I mean, there's been a documentary, there's been articles in the paper, and in fact, there, there's been at least one book by Stephen Davis on this. Um, uh, did you work with Stephen Davis to, 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 to help him with his research? 
Well, I think that's putting it a bit strongly. I mean, I've been in touch with Stephen over quite a long period of time, and I admire what he's done. He's been very tenacious. He's a, a journalist who's capable of writing a good book without my involvement, I think. Um, obviously, I was very happy to to work with him in the sense that we, we kept in touch and told each other what we were doing. But um, no, I mean, I think the, the, the sad lesson from this is that um, if a government wishes to perpetrate an untruth uh, and to continue to do so long after the event, then uh, they can do so, that they're not held to account either by the press or by parliament's sufficient means to uh, change their, their behaviour and their story. One need only look at the recent events with um, with the post office uh, and the shambles and dis- dishonesty and prosecution of hundreds of sub-postmasters which has taken place in this country over a long period of time. That's been in the press, private eye in particular, but other publications too, dragging on for years. And because it took an ITV documentary, ministers suddenly found out what was happening. Well, they didn't suddenly find out. They knew all along. We were forced into action. So the threshold for forcing ministers to do the right thing is quite high, unfortunately. So you, I mean, this all begins under a Conservative government, Mrs Thatcher. Yeah. You talk about a debate in Parliament in 2007. Of course, there's a Labour government at that time. Yes. Um, clearly, whatever secret state powers are being applied, they, they transcend party politics, or they did then. Um, it, it must have been a very big secret for somebody to want to maintain it for so long. Well, I don't know about the, the, the institutional small C conservatism of the, of the government never wants you to admit it's done something wrong. I mean, that's the, the, the body politic, if you like, of the government, never mind not with the one particular party. I mean, I do think after 17 years in 2007, there was no reason really at that point the Iraq war had come and gone. There was no reason to to maintain this fiction. There was no reason not to tell the truth. The Freedom of Information Act had come in in 2005. We were supposed to be in a different era. And the truth should have been told. And if you want to look at it from a purely party point of view, and I agree it's not really a party issue, but if you did look at it from a party point of view, then, you know, the Labour government in 2007 is very different to the Tory government in 1990. So there should have been even fewer compunctions about telling the truth. But they held to the line. In fact, ironically, as I put out, pointed out in my debate, um, Mrs Thatcher herself came near the truth. I mean, not the truth, but she came near the truth in terms of timeline when she issued her memoirs at the Downing Street years. And that was actually near to the truth and she statement, she, the statement she made in 1990. But Jeff Hoon was still hanging on to her 1990 statement rather than what she said in her memoirs. Interesting. Because this was called Operation Sandcastle, wasn't it? Uh, Operation Sandcastle was the operation subsequently to, as I understand it, the operation subsequently to gather information uh, about what had happened, uh, which Tom King initiated, the, the relevant minister in the, in the Conservative government, uh, to take evidence from the survivors, if you like, and, and those who were witnessing what had happened in Iraq. Uh, and that was compiled, but never released. Um, Anne Cluid, the Labour MP, then um, reported uh, the government, um, Jeff Poon, I think, actually, again, to um, the parliamentary ombudsman at the time before FOI kicked in, it was a pre-FOI thing, um, for failure to to release that document. As far as I know, it's never been released. And again, uh, you know, people who were on that flight want closure, and part of that closure is the release of that of that uh, of that document. I mean, so, some people got compensation. I mean, is this? Did the British um, hostages get compensation? No, British Airways got compensation because the plane was blown up. They did rather well at the insurance company for the plane that was blown up that landed there. Uh, and it's also the case that other people on the flight got compensation. Uh, I think the French paid out compensation for those who were on the flight who were French nationals. Um, and I think the American, I think I'm right in saying the Americans paid compensation where appropriate. It's only the British who haven't been paid. And there was something called the Information Operations Unit. What was that? Uh, well, I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean, there are all sorts of hidden bits and pieces around uh, around government. I don't know what that particular one was. But it wasn't a victimless crime, this, was it? Uh, if crime is the right word. In order to put a handful of special forces, ex-special forces people into Kuwait, they risked the lives of, I don't know, was it two or 300 people who, who had to suffer being held hostage, um, threats of death, um, the famous occasion when that child is put on television with Saddam Hussein. All yes. of this flows from that. Um, I'm astonished to hear yeah. that nobody on the British side got any compensation. I, I had no idea of that. No, well, it's, it's, I think it was 600 people on the plane, from memory. Um, and you're right, Stuart Locker was a five-year-old boy who was traumatised by being patted on the head by Saddam Hussein. I mean, that image is, is one of those which 
everybody who saw it remembers it um, from all that time ago. It was so horrific, actually, to see that. So we've not had compensation. And and I think, obviously, there's a need for that. But I, mean, I think more than anything else, what people want is the British government to come clean and to tell us what happened properly. Um, I just wonder whether um, ministers themselves now have been told the truth. I mean, Liz Trust revealed this information when she was foreign secretary about the fact that BA hadn't been uh, hadn't been uh, warned about the situation. She then also repeated, however, the allegation, the suggestion that uh, special forces hadn't been on the plane. Um, one wonders whether she just being repeated what she was told or whether she actually looked into the matter herself. I mean, do you think the situation has got worse? And I mean, how do we make it better? I mean, is it a matter of uh, whistleblowers coming forward, politicians, as you say, putting pressure on civil servants to tell them more? Um, more parliamentary committees really trying to hold the, the the body politic to account? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that because I'm, I'm afraid what I've concluded in recent times is that the ability of the government of the day to say something which is untrue or misleading and get away with it has increased. Um, I think the lesson from COVID has been that uh, people will do what they're told and, and uh, will, will believe the government of the day. It's quite extraordinary that people don't trust politicians, but they believe the government. Uh, the government, of course, is full of politicians. So that's that's a weird situation. It's also the case of terrible churn in government, both at civil service level and at ministerial level. I mean, how many housing ministers have we had in the last 15 years? I mean, one would be six months or something. So nobody gets a handle on what's going on, even now, you know, and day-to-day -day matters, let alone what happened a long time ago. And it's a kind of instinctive... Um, response by the establishment, if I can use that old-fashioned term, to kind of sweep everything under the carpet, let sleeping dogs lie, I think is the yes minister would have put it. You know, why why stir something up when it's been put to bed? I think it's a natural civil service instinct. I'm very keen to... Sorry, integrity of politicians and, and civil servants changed, do you think? Uh, that in the past, um, you know, this wouldn't have happened, or do you think it's always been like this? And and we're now finding, for example, that there's no proper record kept because all these WhatsApp messages are, and texts yeah. are, are basically deleted. Well, I think in the past there would have been a better record kept of everything. Um, it wouldn't necessarily have been made public. I'm sure there were lots of things that happened in the past that we don't know about. Um, but there would have been a record of it. And I think that started, the rot started in that sense with the Tony Blair government, and he started having meeting SOPA meetings without being proper minuted in the run up to the Iraq war. Um, it's got worse, I think, with uh, with WhatsApp messages, uh, particularly those which, you know, there seem to be a, an unwillingness to recognize that they are, in some senses, a public record in due course. I mean, Boris Johnson's approach to, to WhatsApp messages is, is quite shameful, really. So I think standards in that sense have declined. You've got to couple that with the fact that the press and the media are less investigative than they used to be, which is, I think, a partially a function of money. It's partly a function of the Internet, actually, which is a, a competitor. Um, in a number of investigative journalists on newspapers are now far fewer than it used to be. The idea you can set someone off and give them two months to go and investigate a story that Nick Davis and The Guardian used to have, you know, those days have long gone. You know, the journalists got two days or something to look through a story, and then they move on to something else. So I think those who wish truth not to come out are very happy to just allow a couple of days of bad headlines, and then the public will move on and forget about it, and, and rely on that. And do you think also there are more legal uh, uh, concerns? I mean, slaps and, and other things that are used by rich and powerful figures to prevent people talking? Well, of course there are. And, and of course, the libel laws in this country are, are famously unhelpful for those who want to pursue investigative journalism. And if you're a newspaper with a, uh, a very tight budget, you're having to sack journalists, um, you know, your circulation's going down, as they all are, then it's much easier to get headlines by reporting on, I don't know, Princess Kate's fingernail colour than it is to investigate <laughs> something more serious. Yes, no, it is the sort of clickbait journalism. Because, I mean, you've been a doughty campaign on a, a campaigner for a lot of things. I mean, can you talk, for example, about the David Kelly case? I know you couldn't at one point. Well, I always could do. I just, I just, I'm not quite sure there's very much more I can, I can do. I spent a year or so of my life investigating that matter um, and uh, wrote a book which caused a bit of a stir. Um, probably didn't do any good politically, politically because um, putting your head above the parapet never does, actually. Another problem in life. People who prosper are the ones who, behind the scenes, play the game. 
Uh, those who don't play the game tend not to prosper, actually. Well, um, you've earned a lot of respect for what you've done. I mean, can you tell us a bit more about the Kelly case for the listeners who may not be aware of what happened? Well, briefly, David Kelly was 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 a, a good man. He was um, a, a British citizen who was involved in, in UN, UN weapons inspection. Uh, he did a great deal to expose, for example, what's been going on in, in both Russia and uh, the Middle East in the 1990s. And he was heavily involved in, in looking at what was going on in Iraq. Um, and he was of the conclusion that, um, uh, I think I'm right in saying, of course, I never met the man, but I think he was of the conclusion that um, the, the, the statements coming out of Downing Street, which were suggesting, um, you know, 30 minutes of doom and all this kind of stuff, which which Alistair Campbell and people were promoting, uh, was, was not right. Um, and uh, that was inconvenient, of course, to someone of that nature who didn't believe um, what the government was saying. And he met Andrew Gilligan, who was then a journalist for the Sunday Telegraph, I think it was, and the BBC at that point, Sunday Telegraph before that, for the BBC. Um, and uh, he became the, the source that informed Andrew Gilligan of, of um, his doubts. And I think doubts from others inside the defence establishment. Um, that subsequently caused a kerfuffle um, uh, when Andrew Gilligan ran his piece, of, I think it's seven minutes past six or something on, a, on the Today programme in the morning. Um, and um, uh, there was a, then a witch hunt, really, and I use the word advisory, not in the kind of callous and, and general way that Donald Trump used it for everything, but there was a witch hunt to try and find out who was responsible for uh, Andrew Gilligan's report, uh, and uh, David Kelly was flushed out. Uh, subsequently, he was found shortly afterwards dead on Harrowdown Hill um, in uh, very suspicious, to my mind, in very suspicious circumstances. Uh, within a matter of hours, uh, it turned out that, um, well, Tony Blair had allegedly been told he was in the air flying to Japan. Um, within a matter of hours, uh, a public inquiry of sorts had been set up. Um, Lord Hutton had been appointed. The terms of reference had been agreed. And Parliament acted with such speed. And, well, not Parliament, government acted with such speed. And, of course, that meant that the whole media pack was then focused on the inquiry we set up rather than on the circumstances regarding David Kelly's death. And to cut a long story short, a great deal of medical ex expert opinion and my own in investigation suggest it was impossible for David Kelly to have died in the way that it was suggested, which was to have cut his ulnar artery, which is a tiny artery in your, in your wrist, and die from that. One person died, from, I got this from the National statistician Karen Dunnell. One person died from cutting the ulnar artery in 2003. So presumably that was meant to be David Kelly. Uh, it's almost impossible to die that way. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what was, was the other evidence? What was the other? Sorry to interrupt. The other medical evidence that um, that didn't didn't add up to a suicide and suggested a possible murder. Well, there was there was um, well, first of all, the 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 the, um, the blade use was was. Um, um, a, a blunt one, so it would have been incredibly painful to have, to have used that. I mean, David Kelly was an expert in weapons of mass destruction. I'm sure if he wants to kill himself, he could have found a much cleaner way of doing so, and much less painful. He's also supposed to have consumed, I think, a 29 chlorophyxamol tablets, um, uh, and yet he had a version of swallowing pills. So he was due to have behaved, we're being told he behaved in an extraordinarily counterintuitive way. Um, I was also told by my Pedersen, who was his um, perhaps his closest friend, who used to work for the CIA, had a long conversation with her, um, that he damaged his uh, arm shortly beforehand and was able unable to cut steak in a restaurant. So the idea he would then use the same hand to <laughs> cut his ulnar artery. I mean, just, these things are just beyond belief. There was also a whole whole lot of contradictory evidence uh, given to the so-called inquiry, which Lord Hutton uh, concluded that because it was contradictory, it meant everybody was telling the truth. Had it all been saying the same thing, that you have suspicion they'd put the story together, which is an odd way of looking at how evidence should be interpreted. Lord Hutton himself, subsequently, Lord Hutton, who was appointed, had never chaired an inquiry before, uh, except into a river, river diversion in Northern Ireland, so you hardly qualified for that. He was, however, regarded as a safe pair of hands by the government of the day. His inquiry was not a statutory inquiry, it was a non-statutory inquiry. It's the only time ever that a non-statutory inquiry had to place a coroner's inquest. The coroner uh, it, down in, in Oxfordshire was bundled off the case, wanted to carry on, and was told by the government to stop investigating the matter. The government told the coroner to, fund, to get off the case. This is what we have. Nobody shouldn't be bothered about that, apart from me at the time. 
Uh, none of our wonderful press journal, press pack seem to be interested in that. Um, Do you have your yes. own theory? Do you have your own theory about how? Yes, let me died? just finish the, the evidence bit first. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the non-statutory inquiry spent most of the time looking at the BBC and the government. Lord Hutton came out and slammed the BBC and cleared the government, and it led to the resignation of uh, Greg Dyke and, uh, as as um, Deputy General and Gavin Davis as Chairman of the BBC. Richard Ryan, the Deputy Chairman, a Tory, then came out and apologised to the government for that. And in my view, the BBC has never recovered from that appalling misjudgment of apologising to the government. You should never do that as an independent broadcaster. And the BBC has been frightened to do anything ever since, which is why it didn't cover even things like Jimmy Savile subsequently and the post office and everything else. The shadow of its former self, which is a great sadness to me as a dependent of the BBC. Lord Hutton himself, in a subsequent article for uh, the Inner Temple Yearbook, uh, that racy publication, I'm sure you've had a look at it, um, um, admitted in this in his article that he hadn't bothered looking into David Kelly's death very, very much because he thought the facts were very clear. So he hadn't even done his job properly. People who should have been called to give evidence were not called, including the police officer in charge of the investigation. My Pedersen, who had stuff to say, wasn't called. Uh, and when someone did offer some interesting answers, one, I've forgotten who it was, a pathologist, I think, was asked if the uh, if the um, what, what he saw was consistent with suicide, he said, I think it was a pathologist, said, yes, if you ignore the other factors. So Lord Hutton, did he say, what are these other factors? He said, no, thank you very much, the end of the evidence. But that was the kind of inquiry it was. Uh, in fact, it shames the word inquiry. As to what actually happened, I set out in my book that um, it was very clear to me and to the medical profession um, that uh, he hadn't committed suicide. It was much less clear what had happened. There are a number of theories which which were possible. None of them were very high percentage theories. Um, and I set out those in the book, and people can make up their own minds. Miles Goslett, the um, journalist, subsequently published another book on David Kelly as well, and he came up with a different theory, which um, was that David Kelly had been subject to interrogation from the Minister of Defence, had had a heart attack on them, um, and it was going to be too embarrassing to admit that, and therefore suicide was created. Uh, whatever the explanation, he did not um, commit suicide. And I mean, there was some suggestion that pressure was put on him that he was going to lose his pension. Um, I mean, that was that was one of the arguments, uh, and that affected that. Uh, that's the argument for the suicide. But but you say all the medical evidence is clearly points to 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 him being killed by someone else. Yes, or, or or having a heart attack and dying, as Miles Gosler suggests. Um, I mean, there was an issue about the pension afterwards for Mrs. Kelly, who um, actually had a letter published, I think, in the Times about six months after his death, um, complaining about the financial arrangements which had been in, uh, applied. Applied. Uh, it may be, and here I'm surmising, there's no evidence for this that I have, but it may be that um, the government said, well, of course, as he committed suicide, in our view, uh, or at least what we say, uh, that rules out a pension being paid. But if you play ball, then we can smudge it all over and pay it. I mean, that's one possible uh, way of dealing with the pension, I think. Because the, the family have actually been rather quiet, haven't they? As if they have been bought off. They, they, they haven't really pressed for more inquiries or anything, have they? Oh, indeed, Mrs, Mrs. Kelly has been very keen. Mrs. Kelly's view on, on the day was, a, was not to worry about matters. Uh, that, oh, he's out somewhere, he's probably damaged his leg or something. Um, she was unworried and took a very long time to call um, for any sort of search for him to take place, hours, which suggests that she might have known where he was going. And that might be that he had said, I'm going to go and see the MOD or something. So she may not have been worried. Um, you know, subsequently, she said, oh, I, I, she was terribly upset. He was, uh, you know, he was clearly below the weather and all that sort of stuff. So her interpretation of how David Kelly was in the day Changed subsequently, um, and in, in the intermediate intervening period, she had a meeting with Jeff Hood who came to see her. So that might be a, a factor to bear in mind there. Um, she's been very keen not to pursue the matter. Um, she she wants to not talk about it. She's been trying to put people off talking about it. She's disputed to beat to the press, and more to the point, she's actually persuaded her daughters not to talk about it either. There's a BBC journalist went to see one of the daughters in Newcastle, uh, got as far as Newcastle, and when when he got there. The daughter said, I'm very sorry, my mother told me not to speak to you. So she shut the thing down, really. So, I mean, does, does that suggest that they were bought off? That, I mean, basically, if they talked, they wouldn't be getting the, the pension? Do you think that's, well, that's one that's possible interpretation of the situation. 
or, or they went through a whole awful family trauma. Yes, they, they do right. accept what the authorities say, and they just don't want to talk about it. Just to be fair, yes, um, that's right. I mean, they may not have been told the truth. I mean, they've been told something other than truth. And and as you say, it's always to lose your father and your husband, although they weren't close. I don't think the Kellys. I mean, Mr. and Mrs. Kelly, to lose your father and your husband in very public circumstances is clearly going to be difficult for them. Can I just, I mean, sorry to, to wrench you back to the original conversation, but uh, Andrew wouldn't let me get a word in. Sorry, I, I wouldn't. Ask my, I want to ask my question about, because <laughs> I'm, I'm rather keen on all the cloak and dagger stuff. I'm sure you are too. How did you find out that there may have been these ex-special forces people on that plane? And how was it that you ended up getting evidence from them? This to me seems to be the, the key to it all. Well, they contacted me. I mean, I, I, I've become known, I think, from, from stuff I said publicly that I was interested in it. And I think they wanted to put the record right. I don't think they were comfortable with it. And again, in the same sort of way, you know, they had shared my view, which is that they weren't taking a view for or against the operation. I mean, I've never said it was right or wrong for them to get off the plane. I mean, it's a, I don't know the facts. I don't know what they were going to do. And uh, it may well have been that someone took the judgment that the national interest was better served by getting them off the plane, even if it endangered the public. I don't know. I mean, I'm not in a position to judge that. But I think they're in the same position as me, that uh, there's no reason for the truth not to be told. I think oh. also the passengers noticed these you know, eight burly men getting off uh, who didn't look like typical passengers, who may have been carrying equipment that didn't look like a, a, a modest little suitcase. Wasn't that one of the things? I mean, it's been coming from the yeah. passengers and, and crew as well. Yeah, the passengers and the crew were, were, were very clear that there were people who, who, who were dressed in military uniform, if you like, or you know, camouflage, whatever. And, and got off the plane very quickly at the end when they arrived in, in Kuwait. So, yes, I mean, you know, who do you believe? A whole lot of passengers, the British pe people in the foreign office in Kuwait, the crew, the Americans, or do you believe Jeff Hoon? I mean, it's, you know, no, no, no conscience as I'm concerned. Interesting. And they were I mean, never accounted for in the hostages then, these men. All the other people were, were paraded on television or uh, at some point. Well, they disappeared. The they disappeared into the, just disappeared. wherever they disappeared to, into the sand. And and the, the list of passengers, I think, was was also withdrawn, I think, a day later, so that no one could actually check the names. Uh, yes, I believe that to be the case. I mean, I mean, the whole thing was subject to a very, very quick cover-up. Um, there was an official story. This happens, you know, you get an official story, it's put out, and then everybody has to stick to the official story, irrespective of the truth of the matter. Um, but, you know, Andrew, this, this sort of behaviour, I mean, maybe it's not just Britain, maybe it happens in other countries too, I just don't know. Um, but maybe there's a reason for things to be kept secret that we don't know about, and people make a, an accurate judgment as to the rights and wrongs of that. But I just think that, you know, with the passage of time, things should come out. Um, you know, for example, I've done a lot of work, as you have, on on um, on the royal family. And, I was going to um, and, and, you know, it's very clear to me that, that Edward VIII was, was a, a Nazi sympathiser, um, and uh, it's very convenient for Neville Chamberlain and others uh, at the time, not uh, Baldwin, rather Stanley Baldwin and others at the time, that he should he should hitch up with Mr. Simpson because that was a perfect suit to get him off the throne before the coronation. And I think that was a driving force personally, uh, no, rather than anything to do with Mr. Simpson. But we're not told that. Well, why can't we be told that? That's now almost a hundred years old. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, one finds even protection files from. Well, that's right. Andrew can't even get files from was it the twenties. Yeah. So about I mean, royal protection stuff. And, I mean, it's nonsense. And we're seeing files that were open now being closed. Yes. Um, so it's, we're sort of going backwards. And I think you also have concerns about how transparent they are about their wealth and how they make their money, because it's one of the focuses of my book on Andrew. Uh, I believe that he used his position as trade envoy to basically line his own pockets. I think there's no doubt about that. And I, I've always said, uh, and I say so regularly on TV and radio, that I think, um, notwithstanding Andrew's pretty shab sh shabby uh, association with Epstein and everything else, that actually the biggest scandal is a financial scandal. I agree. Um, and, and how he can misrepresent this country to his own for his own benefit. He did a lot of damage. He wasn't just neutral. He wasn't just making money on the side. He was actually clot hopping, clot hopping around, damaging this country by his by his um, idiotic saloon bar behaviour in different countries. And making money on the side as well. I mean, what image did that present to Britain? Yeah, no, I agree. Are there other campaigns that you're working on at the moment? Or, or, or has it been more difficult since you stopped being an MP? 
Uh, no, I mean, I, I continue to to pursue um, campaigns where I think there's been cover-ups and where I think the public should be told something. I mean, I just, I'm never very convinced that um, it changes very much, but there's no reason not to do what you think is right in life. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you can you can you can prove something. I mean, I think we proved that BA one four nine had special operatives on board. I mean, it, it, it seems to be very clear. But the government said it didn't, so that seems to be the official version, and no one did much about it. I'm pretty clear that um, you know, Edward VIII was was a was a Nazi sympathizer, and that's been proven as far as I'm concerned. But again, that's not the official well, version. I have to my book. Clearly, I'm very clear that David Kelly didn't commit suicide. I mean, and so a lot of other people. Um, including, I might say, a lot of politicians who told me privately they agree with me, they want to put their head above the parapet. So, you know, but again, that's not the official version. Um, I, I worked on, I've been doing some work on, some further work on uh, Gareth Williams, if you remember him. He yep. was the um, MI6 operative, well, GCHQ really, but seconds of MI6, who was, who was found in a locked bag in his bath. And the coroner concluded um, that it was uh, probably murder. Um, the investigating police officer, Jackie Sabia, concluded it was, it was probably murder. She was bundled off the case, just like the coroner was bundled off David Kelly's case. And then a subsequent police investigation said, oh, no, he put himself on the back. Uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, a sex game gone wrong or something, well, uh, which the, is absolute nonsense. I mean, the heating was on full in his flat. This is, this is his flat. He was found in the bath in his flat in Alderney Street in London. The heating was on full in the middle of summer. Um, the, 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 the shower curtain was drawn. The lights were off in the bathroom. The door was closed. He was in a sports bag um, with a key under his body for the padlock because he was zipped into the bag and padlocked. And somehow he supposed, was supposed to be told by the police now that he was he put the padlock on himself somehow from inside the bag and then put the key under under his body. And switched all the lights off. That is in the dark, by the way. And put the heating on for for no apparent reason. And also left no fingerprints, no DNA in the bathroom, on the padlock, or the bag, or anywhere else. And we're told this is what he did as a sex game. I mean, I just ask people to believe, you know, can they really believe that load of nonsense? Well, I mean, apart from demonstrating that he couldn't possibly have locked himself in this bag, I mean, they then tried to discredit his reputation, suggesting he was a cross-dresser. Yes. I mean, it's almost to embarrass the family, to, again, to shut everyone up, because... Well, it, it diverts... It, just like the, the announcement of an inquiry on David Kelly diverted the press from what happened, uh, the announcement or, or the leaking of stuff on, on alleged sexual misdemeanours or, or, or behaviour uh, is a way of getting the public press, the, the tabloids, you know, um, interested in, in diverted onto that. But it's not without form. You might remember Stephen Milligan, who was investigating arms to Iraq, I think it was, in the 1990s, um, who was subsequently found, Tory MP, subsequently found dead with, um, you know, women's clothes on an orange in his mouth or something. And that was all leaked to the press. I mean, there's no evidence that that was actually what he was like. Uh, there was evidence he was quite close to the truth in a number of embarrassing matters for the government of the day. Uh, that's also happened to one of our one of our operatives in, in another country, which is another case in I referred Chile. to in, in my article on uh, on Gareth Williams. You know, this is this is what they do. Yeah, and um, Phil, I don't know if you've got anything you want to. No, add to I mean, it. it's. Um... We've covered full a lot of, respect, of ground. Full of respect, Norman, for your history of campaigning on these difficult matters. And it, it's sad that it's left you, it seems to be rather despondent, <laughs> rather than kind of victorious in, in most of what you've done. But maybe that's, I am, I am that's... totally despondent, uh, in a sense, in the sense that if you look at the David Kelly thing, all the people who did, tried to do the right thing lost out, including the BBC. And all the people who did the wrong thing profited quite well. And it's quite interesting to look at these events and look at the key actors five years on and see where they all are because the people who were behaving badly all did rather well out of it and the people who tried to do the right thing didn't um and that's that's very sad and also you know what's really quite sad is when we actually do produce the truth and or you at least produce a, a convincing a narrative that shows what you've been told is wrong um then you know nothing happens life just carries on with the, with the same lives well, it's funny, it, it, when it, we it, talked to Andy Webb, who did investigate the Martin Bashir story, it took him 20 odd years to get yes. the facts out of the BBC. He said exactly what you just said that this, within this institution, the people that blew the whistle, who tried to do the right thing, got 
crushed. I mean, really very badly treated. And the ones who brushed it under the carpet looked the other way. They just rose to the top. All the great jobs, the glittering prizes. And yeah, that can't be right. Well, it can't be right, but I, was, I just hope that, um, well, first of all, I can live with my conscience. I hope they can. Um, it's, it's a serious point. I mean, I, I'm quite, uh, I, don't, I think I've done what I could do, and I feel quite good about that. Um, and secondly, one has to believe in karma. That's, I hope that such a thing as karma exists. I have no idea if it does or not, but it would be nice if it did. Well, I'd love to come back, actually, to you, if, if we may one day, perhaps in the next few months, and do a, a, maybe a longer program on, on the Kelly story and the background to it and Gilligan and the war in Iraq and the 45 minutes. Because it is one of the great scandals. and It does bring in government and the military and the BBC. Let's do that, Andrew, shall we? I think we should. And I think more on Gareth Williams, because, again, it's not clear uh, who killed him. I mean, I've heard stories about Russian mafia. He'd been investigating them with GCHQ and MI6. Yeah. Uh, and then the, 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 the police moved in and basically tried to shut the whole thing down. I don't think the police, the police, the police came in and uh, I think they tried to investigate it properly. They were thwarted by uh, MI6, uh, who wouldn't answer any of the questions. Uh, when, the, when the officer went to MI6, there was, he was said, this is Gareth Williams' locker. He wasn't allowed to look, look in it. There was a bag under Gareth's desk. He wasn't allowed to see what was inside that. It was only at the, at the inquest that it turned out there were memory sticks, which Gareth had, which the police hadn't been told about. So the police were kept in the dark. At one point, they threatened to withdraw from the inquiry because they getting no cooperation. It took a high-level high level meeting with the um, head of MI6 before they actually carried on the investigation. That's how serious and frustrated the police were. Uh, and Jackie Sabir, the investigating officer, did her job properly, in my view. She was a good officer. Um, but then, subsequently, the, someone else in the, in the forces decided that they'd uh, change the story 18 months on um, and overrule, effectively, the coroner. They overrule the rule officer and say, oh, no, no, he clearly put himself in the back. Um, so, um, you know, congratulations to him. I hope he got a promotion out of that. All right. Well, that is definitely one to come back to, don't you think, Andrew? Yes, no, I mean, there's so many good stories. You're so much part of what we're trying to do, which is to, to shine light on some of the injustices and, and miscarriages of justice that go on. Um, and it's only people like you who really, uh, you know, in a sense, hold a, you know, keep the flame of truth going. The awkward squad. That's, yes. what, we like. That's what we like to be. The awkward <laughs> Thank you so much. Being, I don't mind being called the awkward squad. That's fine. No, very much so. <laughs> Cheers and thank you. Thank you very right. much. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, Bye. all the best. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 